Besides beauty and warmth, houseplants can have a practical application inside the home that might surprise you. Hi, I'm Alan Smith. Join me next. Hi, I'm Alan Smith. You know, houseplants have always been such a great way for us to bring nature a little closer to us by having them inside our homes. Today, I'd like to share with you some tips on how to ensure their survival once you bring them indoors. We'll travel to Carmel, California and learn how some of the earliest pioneers took full advantage of plants with practical purposes. One of my favorite practical plants is the aloe vera, known as the first aid plant. It's always there when you need a healing hand. Plus, if your house gets a little stuffy sometimes, I wanna share with you some of my top picks in the way of house plants that are great for filtering the air, such as this Diffenbachia English Ivy. And if your garden needs a little splash of color, maybe it's a little drab this time of year, how about some great sources of color that are also edible? That's right, edible. But first up, we'll take a tour of Carmel, California for a look into the past. That's next, so don't go away. The earliest citizens of Carmel, California took full advantage of what this beautiful area had to offer centuries ago. So let's stop in for a tour of the mission with historian Sir Richard Men. We often forget that at the same time Jamestown was founded on the eastern coast of the United States, Spain sent an expedition along the western coast as a map making expedition and it is they who named this place Carmel the oldest name to appear on a map of the United States, taken from its namesake in the Holy Land, meaning Garden of God. The Carmel Mission and its beautiful grounds stand today as a monument to the Spanish missionary, Father Serra, who left his home to come to the wilderness of 16th century California. This was the favorite of all of the missions that Father Serra founded. It's so much reminded him of his native land that he had a special affection for this place. Now where was he from originally? The island of Mallorca from the small village of Petra. Today we tend to think of gardens as a way of embellishing our surroundings with beauty and as perhaps a place to relax or enjoy. But here where we found flowers in the mission during that period, they had to serve real purposes such as for medicines or for spices or herbs that at could be used for things in such as uh, obtaining dyes for weaving of blankets or the making of paint. This uh, composition of the prickly pear cactus is stunning. And here again we have an example where something was not only raised for its attract attractiveness and its beauty, but also it was a source of food. The leaves could be eaten in stews and just as a vegetable as well as the fruit that it bears. Although we see a different purpose to the mission today, it's still, a, in a sense, a center of community. It's the site of the local parish church of Carmel, as well as providing an elementary school, a site for community events, a place where concerts are held, and hopefully just a place that people can wander and find a sense of peace, and maybe a little beauty that otherwise they wouldn't find. Now, I want to share with you one of my favorite plants for practical uses. It's the aloe vera plant. Here's a succulent most of us recognize. This is the aloe vera plant, and it's a plant no kitchen should be without. It's a nice enough looking house plant, but the main reason for keeping one of these things around is because of its healing properties. You see, you could also call this the first aid plant. It's developed quite a reputation for itself in soothing minor burns, scrapes, and other irritations. I always keep one nearby, so if I burn my hand or finger, I can just break off one of the stalks and squeeze the gel directly onto my skin. 
you can feel the relief immediately. Aloe vera is one of the easiest plants you'll ever grow. It likes plenty of light. It's ideal for a sunny kitchen window, and it prefers to stay on the dry side, so there's no need to fuss over this plant. You've probably seen the many products out there containing aloe vera, everything from shampoo to hand cream and even pills. But there's some question as to whether aloe vera can actually maintain its healing properties once it's been processed and stored. Some studies indicate that it actually works better when it's fresh, which is all the reason I need to keep one of these little guys around. Another positive aspect about this plant is the gel contains both antibacterial and antifungal properties. Now there's a lot of work being currently done on aloe vera, and it'll be interesting to see what benefits researchers unearth in the future. But until then, it's just nice to have this friend around. Not only are these plants practical, but they have the good looks to go with them. We'll take a look at purple coneflowers and sunflowers when we come back, so stay with us. Beauty isn't skin deep with these plants. Sunflowers and purple coneflowers offer a lot more than meets the eye. Check out some of these practical uses. Summer brings a wide variety of bloom to my garden. Some are exotic and come from faraway places, and others, like these purple coneflowers, are as American as apple pie. They grow wild in fields and along the roadsides in many parts of the country. And of course, you can just about always find them in gardens these days because they're such super perennials. Just look at these blooms. It's amazing how bright and fresh they look, even in the hot summer sun. These make excellent cut flowers, and I often use them in arrangements. There's a lot more to this plant than just a pretty face. You can find it in almost any health food store, but not as purple cone flower and not in this showy form. You see, its other name, botanical name, is echinacea, and if taken in pill form, it can actually boost the immune system. I know this isn't the cold and flu season, but there's nothing nastier than a summer cold. What's amazing about these beautiful garden flowers is that they can actually reduce the symptoms of a cold and cut down on its duration. The active ingredient is extracted from the root of cone flower, and it's freeze-dried to help preserve some of its potency before it's put into pill form. Now, echinacea isn't regarded as a cure for any particular problem. It's just a way to help bolster the body's immune system to get it ready to fight. And that's the reason it's best to take it at the onset of the symptoms of cold or flu. Is it any wonder why these are called sunflowers? Few names are as fitting. The bloom actually looks like a little miniature sun. And as you might guess, for these little guys to perform well, they need full hot sun. You can't get much more American than these. They're natives that have been hybridized into some astonishing giants. Some of them can produce flower heads at least 12 inches across. And then there are others that perhaps don't grow as large but make up for it with a beautiful array of colors. In the past, I've planted the big guys, but since my vegetable garden is small, they tend to overpower it. So this year, I planted this little dwarf variety called Sunspot. The scale of them seems to fit better, and when you mass them in a raised bed like I've done here, they can be quite a splash of color. I planted these from seed about six to eight weeks ago. I just planted four rows of them, spacing the seed a couple of inches apart. These are some of the showiest annuals you can grow, and since they're up and blooming so quickly, it's a good way to get children excited about gardening. And when the seed heads dry, they're a favorite of birds. I'm cutting a few of these blooms before they get too mature, so I can dry them. There's really nothing to it. Just cut as long a stem as you can and hang them upside down in a dry, well-ventilated place. They're ideal for using for fall arrangements. We've taken a look at several types of practical plants, but what do you do with them when you bring them home? Bringing a house plant home and giving it any chance for survival depends on establishing a good watering cycle. You see, too much water or too little seems to be the number one killer of house plants. I've always found it helpful to deep soak new house plants as soon as I bring them home. You can do this by simply placing them in the sink and watering them thoroughly from the top until the water has washed through the holes. 
let them drain, and then repeat the whole process about 30 minutes later. Now this does two things. It thoroughly saturates the soil around the roots, and it also washes out any salt buildup from fertilizer. When you water, make sure it's not too hot or too cold, just pleasant to the touch. Your plants will appreciate you for this, and they'll drink more of it. Also, it's important to realize that too much chlorine can harm your plants. You can easily dechlorinate your water by simply filling the watering can the day before, and the chlorine will evaporate overnight. It's just natural for a plant to produce a few yellow leaves, nothing to get alarmed about. You see, this is particularly true if the plant has been moved to a new location. However, if it produces a lot of yellow leaves all at once, say five or six, you may be overwatering, or the plant may be suffering from a lack of light. For most plants, just keeping the soil consistently moist is the best approach. Now let's clear the air with house plants. My list of the top picks for filtering the air coming up next. Stay with us. Throughout the show, we've been taking a look at the many practical uses that plants serve. They offer a shelter, food, medicine, so many things, including filtering the air. You see, it was NASA that came to this conclusion. They recognize that plants can actually improve our interior environments in a big way. Eight to 15 plants are really all you need for an average size house. And some plants are better air filters than others. The Chinese evergreen, English ivy, even the old mother-in-law's tongue are just a few as well as the stylish Dracaena marginata. The corn plant is another example of one that will clean the air. The way I see it, if the space program recognizes this, then there must be something to it. In keeping with this idea of useful plants, and we've certainly seen how practical house plants are, let's talk about plants for food. Now you've got my attention. Doesn't get much more practical than that, does it? When temperatures begin to cool, I look to my garden to produce some wonderful salad greens. I fill my tiny vegetable garden with lettuce, broccoli, and even pansies and violas. Yes, you heard right, pansies and violas. My spring and fall vegetable garden just wouldn't be the same without some of these beautiful edible blooms. And they're great mixed with salads and even covered in sugar and added as toppings on cakes. A little later, I have a recipe where I'll show you how to do just that. It's beautiful and tasty. If you love old-fashioned flowers as much as I do, then you'll know why I'm crazy about this little penny viola from the flower fields. And while I tend to go for violas that are blue and purple, there are actually many colors to choose from, including yellow and white. What sets penny viola apart from other violas is its compact size and uniform blooms. These tough little guys are more cold-hardy and more heat-tolerant than typical pansies. In the Northeast, Northwest, and parts of California, where temperatures stay fairly moderate during the summer. You can find them blooming throughout the growing season. In mild winter climates, such as the southeast and southwest, the bloom season is from fall through spring. This idea of mixing vegetables and flowers together throughout the growing season is something I really enjoy doing. It can create a beautiful effect in the garden. Now back to this idea of a vegetable garden. Did you know that peppers are not only beautiful to look at and delicious to eat, but they also contain a chemical called capsaicin that's helpful to us in battling pests in the garden. It's the key ingredient in hot pepper spray. Over the years, I've developed quite an appreciation for peppers. Now, when it comes to eating them, personally, I go for the sweet varieties, but I've found an application for hot peppers that helps me get rid of pests in my garden. You can actually use a hot pepper wax spray that'll keep pests on the run. This product combines paraffin wax and other ingredients with capsaicin, the chemical naturally found in peppers that makes them hot. When sprayed directly on a plant's foliage, the wax lightly coats it and holds the hot spray in place. I found this to be an effective and organic way dealing with certain pests in the garden, like leaf hoppers, spider mites, and white flies, just to name a few. Now, when you use this, you need to certainly keep it away from children and you don't want to get any of it in your eyes because it can really burn. But don't be afraid to spray it directly on the produce in your garden. You see it washes off with just a little warm water. Besides peppers, some other helpful plants in the garden are herbs. I just can't imagine my garden, or kitchen for that matter, without them. One of my favorites is rosemary, but I also enjoy thyme, dill, 
fennel, and parsley. Here's a tip I like to share when I hear that someone wants to preserve herbs for use during the winter months. You can chop up pre-measured amounts, say a tablespoon, and then drop them into an ice tray. Freeze them into cubes and then dump the cubes into a zip top bag. When a recipe calls for an herb you've got, just drop it into the mix and presto, homegrown herbs. Remember that a tablespoon of dried herbs is equal to two tablespoons of fresh, so be sure to check what your recipe is calling for so you can measure accordingly. Now let's make our way into the kitchen. I'll share with you a delicious dessert using sugar glazed flowers. It doesn't get any more practical than that, does it? Visit virtually any restaurant these days across the country and you'll find that chefs are using flowers not only as a garnish for food, but as an ingredient as well. Now this isn't a new idea. In the 19th century, bakers used flowers in a crystallized form to decorate confections, just as I've done here with this cake. Not only are these crystallized flowers beautiful to look at, but they're delicious to eat. And it's a great way to use certain flowers from your own garden. Of course, you wouldn't want to eat every bloom. Some taste better than others, but there is quite a range of edible flowers. There are roses, scented geraniums, snapdragons, and a whole host of herbs. If you try using flowers this way, I can't think of a better reason to avoid using pesticides. Now today, I'm using violets, some violas, and mint leaves to decorate this cake. Let me show you the process, it's very simple. First, I created a syrup by taking a full cup of granulated sugar and a half a cup of water. I put this on medium heat and brought it to a boil and let it simmer for two to three minutes until the syrup ran clear. After I allowed the syrup to cool, I applied it to the leaves and flowers and then sprinkled granulated sugar on them. After they've dried a bit, I simply apply them to the cake. The way I see it, houseplants are a very practical way for us to improve the quality of our homes. And what's nice is that some of them, like the aloe vera, can be used for medicinal purposes. So if you don't have one of these in your kitchen, you ought to run out to the garden center today and get one. If you'd like more information on many of the topics you've seen in today's show, just check out my website. That's pallensmith.com. From the garden, I'm Alan Smith. This garden I dream of a bed of flowers Bluebirds sing of the beauty all around us And every time the sun comes out I can't help but smile Oh No, I can't help but smile 